Alrighty, so uh, as I mentioned, we're going to start talking about Kotlin today and a few other basic things about Android. We're going to go through the interface, the IDE for Android Studio, talk about the SDK a little bit, et cetera, et cetera. So basically, get you started on that first app that we did last class. Very simple, kind of just. Android is obviously the operating system. Uh, when we say we're an Android developer, we're developing for that system. We're not developing the system itself. Um, and Android also includes not just the operating system, but also the application framework. So that's also the SDK. Whereas, say, iOS, iOS is the operating system, and Cocoa Touch is the, the framework. But in Android, we kind of use both synonymously. The application framework is also known as Android, the Android SDK, but obviously has nothing to do with the operating system um, because that's a whole other set of um, technologies. But again, they use them synonymously. That's the one difference between the two. It's also based on Linux, which is really, really nice. You can use Linux uh, libraries, including C libraries, C++. Um, if there's a Linux library that you, that you know and love, you can use it. Uh, if you're into pthreads and all that fun stuff, you can certainly use that as well. I don't recommend it. Uh, <laughs> but uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's really, you can get really low level with Android and override a lot of the operating system fail safes, uh, which is really cool and something that you cannot do on iOS because obviously Apple's like, no, you're coming outside of the application. You're doing something that we don't quite appreciate, uh, which is good sometimes. There was an app on the iOS app store where it used the accelerometer to detect uh, how high and far up the app, or the, uh, excuse me, the device was thrown. And so we had these users throwing their devices as high as they could, and it was detecting using the, uh, the uh, accelerometer how high it was going because of time and you know, the gravitational constant was doing a whole bunch of math. And so if it was in the air for, let's say, three seconds, it can interpolate how, how high it went. And, it was supposed to be a competition for your friends. Oh, throw your iPhone up. And so uh, <laughs> that would be something that you'd want Apple to, to put, say, nope, you're not allowed to do that because it has a potential to, um, to, de to destroy people's devices, which it did because people are people. Uh, but on Android, you can do those things. And so that's lovely as developers. We can, we can put that stuff out there for, for the most part. Obviously, Google has their, their requirements and their, their their restrictions as well, but they're a lot less uh, restrictive in that in that manner. They obviously don't want you to do bad things to the users, but you know I'm pretty sure you can have one of those apps out there. Uh, don't quote me on that, but <laughs> as I said, it's a lot more lax in terms of restrictions. Uh, and then finally, um, it, we Android is. Um, it, it uses Java as its uh, as its base uh, programming language, and for right now, um, they might have a new version. But it is actually, we're, if you were to program Android in Java, which you still can if you want to, but it uses Java six, seven, and eight. They might have some features of nine. I think the current version is twelve, or twelve is coming out in March, I believe, um, of this year, something like that. And so what they do is they have to make their own virtual machine. And so they're pulling and picking features of the language as they need them. So they have lambdas now. I think Java 8 has, uh, in included lambdas. You can do a little bit of lambda programming in Android. But not all the features of Java 8 are included on the Android platform. So um, one, I'm not a big fan of Java. But also, you also you're, if you're going to do Android pr programming, you're going to have uh, a lot older Java set that you'd probably be used to if you're a little bit more used to what the modern Java stuff is. Yes, question? I, I, I'm just like an Android Studio. Like when you were programming in Java, if you chose the language to be common, it gave you the option to, like it recognizes that you're using JavaScript, yep. and it gives you the option to change it. Yes. Is that pretty accurate? Like a, uh, yeah, so converting from a Java, if you have an existing Java program or an, an existing Java class, um, yes, it is. I wouldn't say it's 100% perfect to translate it to a Kotlin file. Um, it, it really depends. I'm trying to think of an example. I haven't done it too much. I've done it a couple times um, with large, old Android base uh, code bases. And yeah, for the most part, it's not pretty. But if it's a simple class, it does a really good job. But if you're referencing other Java classes, 
uh, like you have dependencies, it's not so clean. But yeah, if you have a pretty simple app, it should be okay. And that and that might have changed over the years. I think when I did that was about two years ago, when we were trying to convert some from Java Android application over to Kotlin. It was like you could do it one file at a time, piece by piece. As you're editing that file, you can say, oh, let's just convert it over to Kotlin. Leave all the rest of the app Java and just do what I'm working on. And, and that way you can convert stuff over to Kotlin. Um, yeah, I wouldn't recommend that for a large code base. For a smaller code base, you can probably get away with it because it's not as much work. And again, they might have improved the tools since then. But yeah, give it a shot and see. And your mileage may vary depending upon what your, how your class hierarchy and structured, how it's structured. Um, so yeah, um, Google has fully implemented Kotlin and I'll show you an example, but um, they're pretty much supporting it full board now. So um, I believe that's something where Google is going to be going in the future. So let's learn the cutting edge, uh, the bleeding edge. Sometimes it does make you bleed because it hurts. But um, it's been around for a while. Kotlin is a mature language in itself. It's not a new language that they just invented. But it has been around for a while. So in terms of being uh, fully featured and stable, it is. Um, not as much as Java, obviously, but it's uh, it's a modern language, and so it's worth learning. Plus, you already know Java, so if you want to take what you know in Kotlin and apply it to Java, you're certainly welcome to. Um, okay, so finally, <coughs> excuse me, uh, we have the interface. The interface is implemented in XML, so you do all your logic in Java or Kotlin, and then you define your XML, how it's laid out, where buttons go, the IDs of buttons, the values of buttons, um, how they're laid out, how they interact with each other. You do all that in XML. However, for the most part, unless I'm just really frustrated, um, I almost never use the XML anymore. Um, sometimes, again, it's like I can't find a tool. I'll just dive into the XML and change it right there because sometimes for me, that's easier. And I'll show you both ways just in case um, you run into that or you find some code on, let's say, Stack Overflow, and they give you how to add a particular attribute to a text view, for example, they usually show you the XML for that. So we'll go through that. All right, so here's an example of the visual UI editor in Android Studio. So as you can see, uh, there's just a, a text view in the middle of the, uh, the layout here. And uh, We'll go in this more detail, but you can see the kind of little squiggly marks. You can think about those as springs and how the screen stretches on different Android devices, whether it's a tablet, whether it's one of those really, really tall, skinny phones, uh, et cetera. They're all going to have different screen sizes. And so what this allows you to do is make sure that this Hello World is always centered, not only horizontally, but vertically as well. So you see springs on the left and right, and you'll see the springs on the top and bottom. And again, those are just making it centered top uh, horizontally and vertically. All right, so Kotlin. Here's kind of the first introduction to Kotlin. If you're familiar with JavaScript, this might look kind of similar. If you're used to TypeScript, it might look a little bit uh, closer to TypeScript than JavaScript, but it's really not that hard. To define a variable, um, almost always start out with val, so value. Start with val, V-A-L, and then comes the variable name, and then the type is optional. So most of the time you'll see me type in the type, so whether it's an integer, a bool, a string, or another class, I'll usually type it in, but Kotlin kind of does a on-the-fly uh, typecast, and it just figures out whatever the right-hand value of the assignment is. So in, in, as an example, if you're putting in a string and it's in quotes, well, you don't have to put the type because the compiler knows if you're trying to put a string, uh, assign it to a variable, that variable's type is going to be string. Uh, this becomes a little bit problematic if you're trying to do like a float value and you're just like, maybe the float value is five and you just type in five. If you type in five, that makes it into an integer because you're not being explicit about it. If you want to make it explicitly a float so that you could do 5.5, 5.6, whatever, um, then, then you can type in the type. Uh, but a better way, sometimes a better way, is just to do 5.0. And in other languages, uh, such as C++, 
you would have to do like 5.0F, which is fine. I mean, I'm used to it, but it's like when, yeah, it's like, well, why do you have to put the F? It doesn't make sense. Let the compiler do the work for you. And so this is one example of the compiler figuring out what type you want. So sometimes I'll leave off the type. I'll show you a couple of examples of that today. But um, that's how you define a variable. So the val is a variable that can only be instantiated once. And so it's very similar to a constant value. And you can't reassign it. If you do want to reassign it, then you make it into an actual variable. So one, you'll kind of hear me say variable, but it's a value. Um, the latter is actually a variable where it varies, right? So a, var a variable, uh, you just var, and then the variable name, and then again the type, and then the assignment. But I can then uh, do reassign that variable. So if it's an integer, I can say you know, variable integer equals 1, and then on the next line say equals 2, and that's fine. If I try to do that with a val type, uh, the compiler immediately will say you cannot change that value. So um, the reason why you would always want to use val unless you're explicitly going to change it later is because a value, uh, value is a lot more efficient. It doesn't have the overhead of uh, mutators. And mutators are functions or operands that allow you to change that variable. So for example, a string... Um, if I'm doing a non-mutable string, so a string that I can't change, also known as a constant sometimes, that when I create that, that, um, that structure in memory, the, that class drops off all of the, the mutated uh, or the, the mutable functions. So like concat, um, to concatenate two strings, substring, all the things that change that that object. And so by doing that, it makes that value a lot less, uh, a lot smaller in memory and a lot faster when I'm trying to do operations on it. Um, so does it really matter? Probably not. Uh, it did kind of have a performance issue back in the day when phones were really uh, slow. Now, you know, it's basically a supercomputer in your pocket. You can get away with doing this a little bit um, more liberally, but the compiler is uh, pretty good and it'll say, hey, you're not changing this value, maybe make it a val instead of a variable. So again, just start out with val, and then if you do change it, it'll say, hey, you can't change it, but then it'll allow you to retroactively um, make the variable definition into a, a variable. So it'll, you just, you click on a button and it'll go up in your code, find the declaration of that and change it for you. So. Again, it's really easy to change if you ever need to. We'll show you examples of all this. All right, so this is some actual code. Var some int. It is of type int. It equals 5. And then I'm going to reassign that right away to some int equals 4. And then um, we can also, uh, oh, I should mention that um, these are not basic types. These are actually full citizen or first class citizen classes. So in Java, an int is just an it's an object it's um you know it has its number of bytes in memory and that's it in kotlin as well as swift swift does this as well um you actually it, uh, an int is kind of a class it's a little bit more efficient more efficient than a class and we'll talk about that in another in another uh class but um yeah you have things like int.max value um and you have other other functions that you can run as class functions on the int class. So I just showed you one example here, int.maxValue. You can play around with it and see what other functions you can get out of the int class. We can also do something like, in this case, where it's called int. You can do sumInt dot, and then there's a whole bunch of functions on that that we can uh, operate on. All right, so that's an introduction to Kotlin. Again, we'll get into, into the weeds on that. Uh, later, but that's what it looks like. Nothing scary. All right, so Android. Android has a bunch of different, these are major components of Android, certainly not an exhaustive list, but the first and most important thing are activities. This is where our user interface screens will go. And so this is an object that it takes up the entire device screen uh, for the most part, and you can, um, you can stick your widgets directly on an activities. Uh, at least the activities view, and um, yeah, and only one activity can be displayed on the screen at a time. 
If you want multiple screens or layouts or whatever, uh, or not layouts, but you want just different uh, groups of widgets, let's call them. I haven't defined that yet, but uh, you would want to use a fragment. And we'll get to fragments in a little bit. I'm just going to kind of gloss over it real quick, but a uh, fragment is a user interface component. And what that really means is um, I can group widgets or buttons or text views or whatever I have into reusable groups as a, as a view. So for example, our map view. Our map view is, is an independent component. I bundle all of the code within that fragment and then I can use that same fragment over and over and over again in my application. So for example, with the map, I can use maps all throughout my application without having to copy and paste that code in the activity because activities <laughs> are separate classes. Whereas um, if I wanted to have the same functionality in one activity as another, well, I would have to put that, that code in another third class and then somehow tie that, those two activities to that third class. Um, but that third class might not know the exact layout of activity one versus activity two because they might be different. Uh, we'll go over this in more detail when we do talk about fragments, but just think about it this way. A map view, so displaying Google Maps, is a fragment when I zoom in, when I pinch and zoom, when I double tap, when I do all the activity or when I do all the actions on the map, um, all of that code is contained in that fragment, that map fragment. And so I can then take that map fragment and put it in different activities um, and do a lot of code reuse. So that's kind of the gist of, of what fragments are. They're a lot more powerful than that. Uh, back in the day when we did Android 2.2, 2.3, and pretty much everything before that, we didn't have fragments. And so the only way to display stuff on the screen was through activities. And so you'd have to have an activity that was specific to, uh, to that, that interaction. And so it was kind of clunky, and there was a lot more other issues that we won't go into. But um, they introduced fragments with honeycomb and um, that sort of thing. There's a lot more advantages to it. Any questions so far? Let's see. And uh, for those, hopefully, the people that are watching at home, they can post some questions in the top chat. Um, we got a few people on. Alrighty, uh, widgets. So um, widgets, I'll interchangeably <coughs> use these. Widgets could be a button, it could be a text view, it could be a, um, a map view, that sort of thing. We'll call those widgets. But there's also Android widgets. Android widgets are, uh, you can place those on your home screen. It might be a clock. It might be the weather. It might be a, a mini music player. It's like a separate app, but on your on your home screen or on the lock screen or other other than inside the app. And so you might have seen these if you've ever used Android. But that's also those are also called widgets. And then there's services. So the Android services are mostly used for background services or background jobs. Um, so if you're trying to stream music. If you're trying to in invent the next Spotify or whatever, and you want to play music while your app is doing, or excuse me, while your phone is doing other things, you would set up a service that would run in the background that would stream the data in the background and then play it out to the audio system. So uh, we would use a service for that. And the next thing on here is a broadcast receiver. Um, the broadcast receivers are a way of messaging within uh, its intra application. So if I want to message other applications or I want to message within my own application, um, we'll use broadcast receivers. And so this might be something like you're getting a phone call. Uh, it'll, you'll get a broadcast message that the phones, there's something that's, uh, that something's happening and you take, take action on that. So for example, if the phone call is coming in and you're playing a game, you might want to pause that game. Or if you're playing audio, you'll pause that audio, et cetera, et cetera. So it's just a way of getting information about the phone. But you can also send out your own messages as well. Um, all right, so activities. Uh, we're concentrating on activities today. We'll show you kind of how to use them. Uh, they're just going to be a container for all of our UI for right now and, and our logic. But it is a class. It is a subclass of the Android package dot app dot activity. And I put or some version of it because you'll never, well, I haven't seen this in, in a long time, but um, it's never activity. It's app compat or something, uh, app compat 
activity or it's some version of that. And so as we release different versions of Android and then you have app compatibility to be backwards compatible or forward compatible or whatever, um, that class will change. But it's going to be some, some, some class of that. Um, but not that important, just keep an eye out because sometimes you'll get activity mismatches where you'll be subclassing two different types of activities and your code won't work and you'll have no idea why. And you realize one is an app compat activity and the other is just a regular activity or fragment activity. Uh, there's lots of <laughs> different activities. And it's, yeah, it's, it's a little bit of a headache if you don't know about it. So calling it out now. Uh, I'm sure I'll run into it in class as I'm coding. But uh, hopefully not today. Applications can have zero activities. So that basically means it doesn't have a UI. Uh, sometimes if you're just doing like a, a tracking app, I want to launch the, the application, but it's not going to show me anything. It's just going to, in the background, create a, um, uh, a service, and it's just going to report my GPS location to some server, right? Those exist. Um, it could have just one activity, you know, just display something useful uh, or not useful, depending upon your, your opinion. We'll, we'll, we'll do that today is just create a single activity application. Um, and of course, it can have multiple activities. Now. Mm, I won't say definitively, but most applications today, some like there's exceptions to this, and when they are exceptions, it's, they're small exceptions. But most activity or most applications today only have one activity. As I said, there's exceptions to that. But what people like to do for their apps is create one activity and then swap out different fragments to change their UI. Um, <clears throat> So the activity defines and manages the user interface. So again, this is where we put our buttons. But we actually put the buttons in the activities view. And you can swap out views if you want to. Um, but the activity is actually what's going to be your logic. So when I, when I tap on one of those buttons, what happens? What code gets fired off when I tap one of those buttons? That's going to happen in the activities code. And um, as I said, basically, there's only one activity for a screen. We can have multiple activities. We can have one activity launch another activity. But essentially, what you see on the screen, that whole entire picture is going to be the activity. And then you can have fragments. You can have buttons. You can have all sorts of things within that activity. We'll go through an example here in a second. But let me talk about layouts. Layouts, um, these are what's actually defining the interface. So this is the XML that I talked about. And this is going to say where those buttons are, what the ID of the button is, so that we can reference it in code. Um, the defining of the positions, as I said, it, whether it's centered, whether it's uh, vertical, et cetera. Um, the underlying implementation, as I mentioned, is XML. But we use the namespace Android colon to define like um, whether it's the name, so like Android and then ID and yada, yada. You'll see examples of this. but. Um, in the XML, we use Android. And then finally, um, we can have multiple layouts per screen, device, orientation, and resolutions. OK, so what that means is Android is notorious for having thousands of permutations, if not millions of permutations, of uh, screen sizes, device, de actual devices. So whether it's a Samsung um, or you know, whatever, you have slightly different variables. Um, and then. Not only that is, what happens if I rotate it from portrait view to landscape? Well, then your, your resolution changes. It, it flips, right? And so how do you, as a, as a UI developer, how do I handle those UI changes? When I, when I flip the orientation, sometimes I make it wider. Sometimes I'll reorganize re, uh, the buttons. But with Android, what we can do is we can define specifically a layout file for those different resolutions. So for example, uh, let's say the resolution is a high resolution. I can, I can maybe fit a little bit, um, another button or two on the screen. So I can have another file that's specifically for resolutions that are, uh, I don't know, uh, a specific number and up. I can have a separate layout file for landscape versus um, portrait. I can have a separate file for a tablet versus a, a phone. I can have a separate file, et cetera. Now, we try to avoid having 100 different files for these things, because obviously that's it's a nightmare to manage. But if you ever have a client or a user that's like, I have a, 
I don't know. Um, I won't. I won't call in any specific device manufacturers, but I have this one specific device, and it's running Android. You know, insert some uh, Android version number, and I'm running your app, and it. You know, the button is just it's off the screen. And you can take a look at it, you can see what that orientation is, and maybe there's just no way to fit, to fix it for that one sp specific device. You can copy the layout file and, and name it in a certain way to fit one of those, those aspects, right? I don't know, whatever, whatever the, the problem has to be. Uh, we try to make it dynamic enough so that things flow, but one really good example of why we would do this is a phone versus a tablet where I can fit a whole much, a lot more, uh, uh, excuse me, a lot more widgets on the screen for a tablet than I can on a uh, phone. So um, you might want to have a totally different layout for the tablet than for the phone. That's one reason why you use it. Um, here are some examples of widgets. These are actual class names, so you can refer to these in code. Buttons, text fields, text views, which are a little bit different map view and a web view. So uh, those last two are one of my favorites because you have the full functionality of Google Maps within a little tiny window or a big window depending on how you resize it and also you have a fully uh, functional web browser. Um, and by fully functional I don't mean like bookmarks and those types of things but you have full HTML rendering. So a lot of the times if you just want to render something on your screen and you don't want to go through a whole lot of programming you can just drop in some HTML, maybe even some JavaScript, and then have the web view load that file locally, or you can load it from a server. You can do all sorts of things. Uh, you can actually throw straight HTML at it. You can, you know, like uh, begin tag HTML, end tag, blah, 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 like the whole HTML as a string, throw it at your web view, and it'll render it for you, which is really, really powerful. Um, and that'll, um, that's one way to get like rendered text, like color text where one word's red, the next word's blue, et cetera, et cetera. Um, that's also known as an attributed string, but if you don't want to get all that fancy, the web view can, can really save you. Now, having said all that, it is a lot of overhead to put a whole web browser in your app if you're just using it for text and simple things like that. So do be careful with that. But it's really powerful. All right, so in the XML, um, I'm not going to make you memorize this or anything like that. I just want to show you and go through some of the pieces of it but it does look like HTML if you're familiar. We begin our tag in this particular case with a text view. Uh, so we just define text view as the class. And then as I mentioned, the, the namespace is all defined with Android colon. So this is the ID. Uh, we'll talk about the format in a second, but just know that this is where we're going to refer to this item in our code. So we're just gonna look up this button. So when a button gets tapped or something like that, we wanna know which button it is and, and write code for it. We'll use that ID that's in our layout to, um, to um, define what happens when that button gets pressed. Or if we want to put text in programmatically, we get the ID for this guy, and then, um, and then we put the text into that reference. Uh, OK, so real quick, the layout width, the way out, layout height, um, <clears throat> whatever goes inside that, we're going to wrap it, uh, which means just don't make it as big as it needs to be. Just wrap it to whatever the content is. So if the content is really short, that uh, height and width will be really short. I'll show you what that looks like when we add more content. And then we're also going to say center horizontal, center vertically, and then finally the text that's going to be in it is not real text. It is a, uh, a variable. So the at symbol is an attribute of the string refer uh, resource. The resource, we have a resource file with all of our strings contained in it. And there's a string in there called hello world. And so we're just going to say, take that variable from that resource and put it in here. Why don't we hard code it? Well, you could. You could literally just type in hello space world. But when you go to translate it or localize it, um, what you can do is you can take that strings file, give it to your friend or uh, an agency, a professional agency that does translation, and have them go through just an XML file and replace uh, just the actual text in here. So for example, hello world, that's the variable name. As a value for that, in English, it's hello space world. In other languages, it would be whatever the language is. So um, you can, again, take that file, send it off. They change all those values. They send it back to you. And then you name that strings file appropriately. You put it back into your application. 
you bundle it after you compile it, you send it out to the world, and if I have my Android device set to, I don't know, Japanese, German, whatever, it will pick that language up from my phone device, it'll look to see if I have a strings file that matches that language, and then uh, insert that text dynamically for you. So we're not going to hard code text in our, in our applications. Yes, question. Um, It wraps the text view container, so the box, to the text that's inside of it. So as the text grows, the, um, the text view will grow as well. Uh, text views are a little bit different, though. But let's say it's a button. Um, a button says, press here to submit your, uh, your, your, your data or whatever. That's going to be a really wide button. And, uh, and if I do wrap content, it will try to make that button as small as it can. Uh, whereas there's another value, match parent, for example, and that'll match the parent container and just make it as big as it can that's contained inside that, or that button's contained inside of. So we'll go through the different values of these, but um, yeah. Um, <clears throat> so yeah, this is just another example of that. We'll just skip through that because we're not running low in time, but I'll get through these notes so you can see some actual code, but let's get to the code. So as I mentioned, we have that underworld, uh, excuse me, um, uh, oh, this is why. So this is what the XML looks like. This ID in this particular case is hello world underscore text view. Don't worry about the at plus ID yet. We'll talk about that in a second, but just know that my ID is hello world text view. So I'm going to create a value. I'm going to have a variable or value called hello world text view. It is of type text view, and I'm going to set that assignment equal to this function. This function is going to be find view by ID. Uh, if you're familiar with JavaScript, it's kind of kind of the same thing where you look up a, a particular HTML element by ID, and you pass in an ID based on this R class. This R class is going to contain all of the values, constants, strings, resources, etc., uh, in your application. So it could have image data, it could have strings, but it also has these IDs of these items in our layout. So r.id dot hello world underscore text view. So once we have that, this find view by ID will take that view and assign it to this variable, hello world text view. And then on that hello world text view, we have a attribute dot text and we can set the text of that text field. So that's just how we get a reference to our UI elements in code. All right, here's another example. We have a button. And so with buttons, instead of manipulating the button itself, I want to go the other way. So instead of going from code to UI, I want to go from UI, tapping on the button, to code. So it works almost exactly the same way. We have a button. We're going to give it an ID. So attribute ID, submit underscore button. We wrap the content, make it as small as we can. And then for the text, this one's hard-coded, but just for simplicity, the hard-coded text is just button. All right, so here's where the magic happens. I'm going to do a very similar thing. I'm going to have a value called submit button of type button. I'm going to set that equal to the return value of find view by ID. And then I'm going to pass in that new ID, so r.id. And then whatever I named it, in this case, submit button. All right, so once I have that reference called submit button, uh, instead of setting the text on it or, or whatever I did in the previous example, I'm going to do what's called a, a click listener. I'm going to set the click listener. The click listener is kind of what it sounds like. It listens for the click, or I call it a tap, but Android's really, really old, so they still use, in all their APIs, uh, they still use click, and so that's why. It's just, again, it's from like the mid-2000s, and so um, really it was kind of before, I mean, it was meant for a phone, but there's some history there. But that's why they call it a click listener. Um, you can think about it the same way. Now I'm going to set this click listener um, in Java, this looks a little bit different, but we're going to use this, um, it's kind of like a lambda, or you can think about it, I'm not sure, it's more like an anonymous function, I guess you can say. Uh, it, it obfuscates a lot of the higher or lower level functionality. It actually passes in a variable that you don't really need to worry about at this point. Um, but this is what it looks like. So set on click listener, curly brace, and then whatever logic you want to happen when that button gets pressed. So in this case, I'm just logging to the debug, giving it a tag, and then I'm saying submit button pressed. So that just gets logged to the console. Uh, we'll go through this in a second, the homework. Um, yes, go ahead. Question. Uh, 
do most user actions uh, use as a listener to determine what action took place? Most, in, most interactions, most user interactions happen with the click listener. Yeah, I would say so. Um, so is it pretty similar to like a swing in JavaScript? Or how you use uh, track using watch? I have no idea. Never used swing in my life, thank God. But no, I'm just, just kidding. Um, yeah, so anytime you're tapping on a button, um, that's going to use a click listener. There's other click listeners of different types that you can use, but it's still, it's a click listener. It just listens for a different, uh, a different interaction. Um, so there's sliders, there's, um, there's switches, there's other UI elements that, yeah, sometimes they'll use the click listener. Um, that you can, but yeah, almost all interactions, like all taps, I guess I should say, scrolls, use some sort of click listener. Yeah, hopefully that answers your question. Yeah. <laughs> I won't say all of them do, because I'm probably drawing a blank on some other ones that don't, but um, yeah, like a shake, if you want to shake your phone and, and make that have something, that's not a click listener. Um, that would use the accelerometer, for example, so that's one example where you wouldn't use a click listener. Uh, real quick, the homework. Um, we'll talk about this in more depth. Uh, it's going to be due the end of the day on, uh, was that Tuesday, I hope? Uh, what the end of the day means real quick is uh, if it's due on Tuesday, basically I want it, I want it in your repo by Wednesday morning. So if you want to stay up until 2 o'clock in the morning working on it, feel free. I don't recommend it because sleep is good. But uh, yeah, you're feel, feel free to. Yes? What time does morning? <laughs> um, nowadays, um, uh, I wake up at 6:30, but I'm out of the house by 7:30, and then and then I when I start kind of rolling back in and getting work done is about 10, but that's not to guarantee that I, my first piece of work is going to be this class. I might have other stuff to do, but yeah, sometime probably that morning or maybe later that afternoon, but not guaranteed. I'll pull your repos, and then I'll have all of your assignments. It's like before 10. Yeah, it's probably unusual if I'm going to pull your repo like early the next morning, because yeah, a lot of you guys will ask for extensions, and so. But I'm not guaranteed. Like if I pull your repo, uh, like Wednesday night, and it's not there, I'll be like, sorry, it was due Tuesday. So we'll talk about grading later, uh, or actually, like what happens if you don't get. Uh, projects in on time. I'll put out a syllabus which defines all of that in, in writing. But just to let you know, uh, this is how we're going to grade these assignments. So if you don't submit, you just get a zero. If, uh, if you submit but you don't have working code or very little code and I hit that play button on Android Studio and it doesn't work, um, that's a one. If, um, if it's, um, so that's not working and there's very little code. If it's either not working or very little code, it'll give you a little bit more points. Two, two points, in the, or two, uh, two out of five on this one. Because I'm, I'm seeing that you have put in a little bit of work, so I'll give that to you. Um, three is requirements are missing. So maybe you did it, maybe it works, but I asked you to do two text, view, two text views, and you only did one. Uh, the, the app wouldn't work, but um, yeah, there's something missing, so you get a three. Now, number four is all the requirements are fully satisfied. You think, well, shouldn't that be a five? Well, if you look at number five, all requirements are fully satisfied and you've added something extra, such as design, functionality. Now, this is really going to be up to you and your creativity. Again, I am not very creative. Um, this is why I'm a, a programmer and not a designer. But if you go above and beyond of what I ask you, then you can get the full credit. So come up with something. Uh, some students will put in a funny joke, or they'll put content in that's funny, or um, they'll put content in that's rich, that actually, like, like sometimes they'll do like a quiz, like a quick quiz, and it's like, what's the capital of this state and this, and, and you have to click one of the buttons or something like that. Um, that'll get you a five. If you maybe put in a little design, maybe you tweak the buttons, the colors, something like that, that'll get you maybe a five. but. That might not <clears throat> fully equate to a five. Depends on how much work you put in. So as a couple examples, students satisfy all the requirements and add the design elements that, like you change the button color, maybe change the background color, that might get you a 
So I'm, I'm definitely doing partial credit here. You're missing some features, but you added some design. Maybe you just couldn't figure out how to get buttons working or, or part of the assignment. So you're missing features, so you get a three, but you're like, I can't figure this out, but I want to try to get the high, a higher grade, so I'm going to change the color. I'm going to spend like five minutes changing the colors. Uh, again, that'll get you a few, few extra points, uh, decimal points on that. Uh, and then all the requirements at the top in the class. So if you have the best homework, you can get a 5.0. But there could be five or 10 bests. It's like you guys just put a lot of, a lot of work into this. I'll give 35 fives if I have to. Like there's no, well, I got to give half of you Fs and half of you As. It's not how that works. So if you put in the work, you'll get the grade. All right, so in the next uh, couple minutes, we're going to go through Android Studio. <clears throat> All right, so this is kind of where we left off last class. Uh, if you missed last class, sorry, but you're not missing too much. So I've just created a blank project. Um, with Android Studio, uh, or a blank activity, I should say. And so this is kind of what you get. Uh, my apologies if that text is really small. I'll increase my text maybe next class. Um, I do have a view that's presentation mode. But on the left-hand side is where we have all the files. If you don't see this view, and you see a whole bunch of packages and really random files, uh, you can switch your, your view up here. So ideally, I like to just stick with the Android view of my hierarchy, but if you really want to see what your file structure looks like, um, you can go with the, uh, the packages view or the project files and get very verbose there. But again, that's probably a little bit too much. There's mit maps and all fun stuff that you probably don't want to see, dot idea folders that really don't matter because that's just part of the, the project structure. So again, if you ever see something like that, just make sure your Android, um, the selection is Android. All right, and then what you'll probably see initially is this screen here. So this is obviously our class main activity that Android Studio creates right out of the box. And as I mentioned, the subclass is some kind of activity superclass. So in this case, it's app compat activity. And that's just compatible. It's going to be backwards compatible with earlier versions of Android than what we're compiling for. So um, I'm, I just have the latest SDK version, and I'm compiling. Uh, well, here's a, here's a rule. Always compile with the latest SDK, but compile for the farthest back that you can. And so we kind of talked about that last class, but if I go up to one of these icons, uh, where is it? Oh, man. Okay, let me... SDK. Yes, thank you. Uh, there you go. Thank you. Tools and Manager. Uh, most of the time I just click on the icon. There's also a way to get in from the start screen. SDK Manager. This used to be a separate application, but now it's built into Android Studio. And you can see all the versions of Android, the Android SDK. So right now, actually, there's an update available. I'll go ahead and update that later. Um, always try to go with the latest. You don't have to be bleeding edge like eight, or excuse me, nine just came out um, the last couple of months, I think in August. And it's probably best practice to use that to compile against. But again, with the minimum version that your users can run, you want to make that as far back as you can. So usually about API level 19 um, if you want to. Or 21 is, is KitKat, I believe. And KitKat's probably, I'm probably on the fence of upgrading to KitKat. But it doesn't really matter uh, in terms of which one at this point. All right, so that's where our, um, our class is going to come from. Now we call the super class onCreate because our entry into the application is the onCreate. This is a overridden function of our activity class. Do you need to know any of this? No, but we'll talk about it here and there and just kind of give you a lower, lower level understanding of Android. Uh, the other thing that I called out last class, set content view. And we're using that r.layout instead of r.id. Uh, and then we're going to give it a layout name. And again, that layout name comes from our resource folder. That's where the r comes from in our r class. And we have 
uh, r.layout. There's a layout folder, and then within that folder, there's an activity underscore main. If I click on that, that's our interface. And in last class, I just typed in hello class. I changed that value here. It used to say hello world. And if you ever want to see the XML, down in the lower left-hand corner of that screen, there is a text uh, tab. Click on that, and that's where all the glorious XML lives. Go ahead, question. Could you uh, use code to auto-generate like, elements? Stuff? Yes. Yeah, if you need to create buttons dynamically, you can certainly create these exact things um, programmatically. Um, it's a bunch of code. It's like, okay, create a new text view, um, set its constraints, set its ID, set, like you basically have to do all of this line by line. Okay. But yeah, certainly you can do it. And it's useful sometimes. Yeah, another question? So, should we use the, uh, the XML design? Yeah, um, it's really up to you as a developer wh whether you want to live in the UI uh, designer or you want to live in code or you want to straddle both, do a little bit in UI, do a little bit in code. That's my preferred method is I really like to just lay out buttons, um, you know, get the buttons, look and feel kind of put in some test values here, so maybe like the longest string that I think is going to go in there, how that lays out, et cetera, et cetera, and then do most of the logic-based stuff in code. I don't like to do any design stuff in code, like I don't like to set background colors in code unless there's some reason logically that I want to switch colors. Maybe when the button's selected, I change that color, or if it's disabled, I change it, but um, I mean there's there's logic functions for that. Um, so yeah, I, I just try to make it a rule where, again, if I'm doing layout or size or whatever, I try to live in the designer. And if I'm doing things like logic, what, like when I hit this button, what happens? Maybe the button disappears. That's logical. I'll, I'll put that in code. So, but it's it's completely up to you. Not everything you can do in the designer. Not everything you can do in. Well, actually, I think everything you do in the designer you can do in code, uh, but it might be harder in code. Because for these, I can I can resize these. I can type. I don't know. Sometimes it's easier just to go in here. Okay. So you'll find out kind of what you prefer. Go ahead. Another question. Yep. Um, so if you if you want to set a custom tag like the design of like text or size or colors and such, yeah. Um, should you keep all that inside the uh, design XML file, or should you like have separate XMLs like as you go on, or? Is Good design. question. Is there like a special way to reference the XML? Yes. Like tags in the code? Yeah, so um, as your application grows, whether you want to keep, so let's take an example. Um, you want to define padding, right, or margin um, in another file because you want to apply that to a million different buttons in your application. You just want to make that a constant and say all buttons need to be 20. 20 pixels or whatever from the left side or, or whatever. Uh, yes, you can have a constant or a val there's a, uh, in our values folder, we have different, I can define colors, I can define strings, of course, we talked about, or I can define styles. If I go into styles, you can see that this one has different colors in here. Strings has what I was talking about before is, um, for example, app name, that's the app name. I can change that. Uh, here's our RGB values. And so you can do like margins and say, you know, define a constant in it in XML of that margin and then use that margin across all buttons. So all buttons have the same margin no matter what. You can do colors, you can do sizes, heights, widths, all, all that fun stuff. That kind of thing, yes, you would want to put into a separate file, but sometimes your application is so small that it doesn't matter. So it's really how you want to architect your application. That's the best practice is to do it that way. But as you guys know, we don't always follow best practices when you're trying to get stuff done. So uh, I won't hold that to you. The only thing I'll enforce in this class is put all your strings in the strings file. Don't hard code it in your XML. It's just it's a really good practice. Um, necessary? Not really. But all right. And then uh, to finish up. I'll stay after class and, and answer more questions, but um, in terms of the actual class, uh, we'll wrap up here in a second. So, um, 
Oh, okay. So I wanted to do real quick the buttons and how to add buttons. Uh, all right, so I have this text field in here. It doesn't have an ID if I go into the text, uh, excuse me, the XML of it. It doesn't have an ID. So I can add one via the designer. So sometimes it's nicer just to go into the designer to add this because I can just type in this is a, uh, a text field or a text view. So actually, what is the type? Yes, text view. Just making sure. Um, I'll do hello underscore text view. Now I'm just going to copy that because I always type, I always have typos. So one way to work for me is just to copy that because then I'm going to go back into my main activity Kotlin file and I'm going to get a reference to that text field. So if you remember, we always start out with val and we're going to do hello uh, text view and it's going to be of type text view. I'm going to leave that off for now. I'm going to set that equal to the, uh, the return value of find, by, uh, find view by ID. Now, if you notice, it's going to accept a value ID of type int. That's really what that underlying r.id value is. Um, and that t, that return value, is going to be a template. That's what that stands for if you've never seen that before. So when I type that in, it's going to ask me, what's the return type for this? So this is a really nice way of typecasting the return value because I'm asking for a view. A button is a subclass of view. A text view is a, tech, uh, is a subclass of view, as well as almost every widget on the screen. So I specifically want a text uh, view. Hit enter on that. Uh, and then I'm going to go into the parameters, and I'm going to type in capital R for the R value. And if you've noticed, this will automatically populate uh, after I add that ID. So I'm just going to type in hello. There it is. Hit enter. Uh, if you saw the return value real quick, uh, let me just show that to you. Uh, if you want to bring back the autocomplete, control space. Okay, that autocompleted it because it knew what I was talking about. Let me uh, give it a little bit harder time. So I just typed in H. Uh, the return value, which is this value on the right-hand side, is of type int. What does that mean? It doesn't matter because it's a constant. You don't need to know what that value is. Just know that the r.id. Hello world, uh, hello text view is that same ID that lives in this uh, layout file. So we'll do this like a hundred times during this course. We'll be getting references to buttons and, and whatnot. All right, so now that we have this reference to this button, again, I didn't put in the type here. Uh, hopefully it doesn't complain on me, but it shouldn't. Uh, I'm just going to do hello view.text to set the text of that, of that view. And I don't know, I said hello class, so I'll say uh, Hello again, and then we're going to run it. So up here in my play button, it's going to initialize my Android virtual devices. I just have one. If you don't have one, click on create new virtual device. Again, there's a video on how to do all that, so I won't cover it. Video, so if you're really curious about Android virtual devices. Um, Okay, so that did not execute. <laughs> Lovely. All right, fun. Um, let me stop that. Just double check that everything. This is the fun part. So. <laughs> Do you have to reset it before you part of the content view? Nope. No, set the content view first. Uh, it's funny because I just did this before class. Now, why, when I said this is fun, I, I kind of meant it because you'll see, I'll, I'll try to teach you a lot of how debugging works because, yes, we'll be debugging applications in class. Now, I'm probably missing something silly. Um, or maybe sometimes you just run it again. Oh. Okay. Go back to that. That was the fun too. Oh, it's missing the... Okay, yeah, I hard-coded it in there. That's fine. Um, I can change the, the value to something, but that's what that warning is. Thanks for bringing that out. So yeah, the ID, uh, hard coded text. Yeah, let me go ahead and just change that just to show you how that works. So as you as you remember, in my as part of my project, we have a, a constant called app name in that strings file. I'll just change it to that. Uh, it'll say first app. It's funny that didn't work though. <laughs> Okay, switch back to my emulator. It actually didn't run because of that. 
I don't know. Let me try it again. So th th literally, this is what I do with debugging. I'm like, okay, I fixed it, but what 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 I changed? Did that really change it? So yeah, that's really weird that that didn't work. And maybe that was an old copy of the app. I don't know. Sometimes it. Okay, that's what I was gonna say. Is I think that was an old version of the app, but it, I waited. <laughs> okay, so that's. That worked. So yeah, no, that was not what I fixed. I just needed to run, or maybe be patient and, and run it again. Um, okay, one more thing before I let you go. I'll do this really quickly. Uh, so now we have a button. We're changing the text programmatically, but I want to change the, the text on button because you didn't see the old text. You just saw the new text come in. So val button of type button. And again, we're just going to do find view by ID. Um, and that's going to be a type button. So Android Studio right away says, I don't know what button is because I haven't imported that library. Um, you can do it one of two ways. This one will auto-complete it, and if I hit enter, it'll automatically import it. But let me get rid of this real quick and see. Uh, you see that little pop-up that happens. It says question mark, android.widget.button question mark. And you're, if you're on a Windows machine, your shortcut might look a little bit different on my Mac. It's option enter, and that'll automatically add the import so if you saw on line six, boom, automatic import, great, thank you, moving on in life. Uh, if you copy and paste code, you might have to do that like six times. And it's locking up. Oh no! Okay, there we go. <laughs> say. My live stream uh, froze as well, so, okay, my computer froze up. Anyway, so there, here we do the uh, ID dot, um, and now we don't have a button, sorry about that, gotta add the button, I was getting ahead of myself. Uh, here's our palette of all we can add, just gonna go to buttons, drop in a button, I'm just gonna drop it in here, that's not where it's going to appear because we haven't put any constraints on it. The ID for this is button, but I'm gonna name it hello underscore button, you'll see why in a second. Save that. Um, Android Studio in the background is compiling it, so that it adds it to the R class, and then I'm gonna type in hello, and again the reason why I named it hello is when I type in hello now I get all of my my variables that I've defined you can come up with your own schema but again if you just do ID there are like maybe a hundred different IDs in the system and you feel free to use these some are um, some are pretty pretty useful uh, but anyway yeah just type in hello now you get your curated list go to button and now that we have the reference to the button Two more lines of code will be done. Hello, and then I'm going to set that on click listener. On click listener. So as you can see, there's a couple other click listeners. That was one of the questions we had. There's a long click listener, and there's a context click listener. But oops, I selected the wrong one, of course. Let me go back. <laughs> uh, select this bottom one. This is going to give you that, that really nice formatting of the curly braces. And so there's the body of code that gets executed when that button gets hit. So I am going to move this up, and if I remember the shortcut, um, it is uh, Command Shift on my Mac will actually move that line of code up into my function. So Command Shift up and down, it's a little shortcut that you might want to use instead of having to copy and paste it back in. All right, so I'm going to save that, run it, and hopefully I'm going to wait this time, make sure the yeah, number one rule of debugging. Just run it again and see if that, see if it happens again. I don't know what it is, but it's it's a little buggy sometimes. Oh yeah, and then switch back to my emulator. Okay, so it says hello class, here's my button. Now again, it's not that button just kind of got shoved up in the top left hand corner because we didn't put any constraints on it. We didn't say uh, align horizontally. We'll show you how to do that next class. But if you squint and you can see hello class and that tiny tiny text I'm gonna hit the button now and you see the text change voila our first app um, homework assignment is basically this with a little bit of extra you'll add an edit text which allows you to input text I'll let you figure out how to use that yourself it's the same it's a different class it's a different widget but it's essentially the same go home figure out how to work it Tuesday come and ask questions Submit that night, and uh, I'll see you next week. Thanks for coming out, guys. Uh, what was the name of your YouTube channel?